Please turn your attention to the word provided by Dr. King. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. As we pray to our amazing Savior. Father, we thank you for this day. God, you've met us here. We came with our anointing and our desire to experience you in the worship. And God, you have met us. We sense your presence. We sense your anointing. We sense your spirit. God, and so now just complete this. Have your way. Speak to us, Father. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Speak, Lord, for thy servants. Hear it. And Father, we'll be so mindful to give you the praise and the glory as we trust you every step of the way on this journey. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. While you're still standing, faith shaken for his glory, read with me out of the book of St. John, the eighth chapter. I'm going to just read a few and Picking up at verse 38, it says, Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of the Lord? the glory of God. Then he took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a praise. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I'm thinking of another sermon. It's something when you... Got one sermon prepared, but you're ready to preach another sermon? I'm almost tempted. Ah, but, but let me just share. We're talking about faith that is shaken. Shaken faith. As I'm uh, just reflecting on the time that we're in, the season that we're in, uh, some call it the season of Lent. Lent began on Wednesday, February the 14th in 2018, and it ends Thursday, March 29th, and it's uh, followed by Good Friday and then followed by that Sunday resurrection morning. But during a time of Lent, it's a time of sacrifice. It's a time of giving up of something in order that we might grow spiritually. It's to remind us of what Jesus gave up as he was focusing on walking toward the cross. And so, uh, if you will, we can take satisfaction as a believer in knowing that there is a point to our suffering and our sacrifices. God uses our struggles. And so, uh, I'll even put it like this, and God is sometimes even deliberate in letting us go through some stuff. Let me say that again. God will sometimes orchestrate things so we deliberately or intentionally have to go through something. Uh, let's look at a text uh, in the 11th chapter of the book of John, and I'm going to uh, just jump around in the text as I'm building a case. Mary and Martha uh, had a brother named Lazarus, and they seemed to be a pretty close family. Uh, in John's gospel, John continues to paint uh, Mary as this 
devout, praying type of an individual. She's one that in the 15th chapter, or the 12th chapter, I'm sorry, she anoints Jesus' feet with oil and wipes, uses her hair to wipe it. They allude to it here in the second verse, that it was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And so you had Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And uh, Lazarus gets ill. He's sickly. And uh, it's not a kind of an illness that uh, didn't take note. It, took, it was an illness that got the family's attention. Apparently, he was deathly ill. But they send him a note, send the note to Jesus. They send the messenger, verse 3, to him saying, Lord, and they use a little something, uh, not just your brother, uh, not just our brother, but whom you love is sick. Now, you know what, as I'm thinking about this text, and we'll just kind of walk through a little bit of it, but uh, and pull little things out of here, but uh, our faith can be shaken in life when there's a void or vacancy or something is taken away from us or something seems to want to come upon us. So, for instance, if um, you are working and all of a sudden uh, your job is taken, uh, then uh, that can shake your faith. If you're in a marriage and... Uh, it looks like it's going in the wrong direction uh, and you've been praying for your spouse and it doesn't seem like they're turning around, that can shake your faith. Am I talking to the right group of people? If you have children that are moving in and you've been praying sometimes up late all night, uh, concerned about them, they don't come in at decent hours, they are, you, you can tell they're into all kinds of shenanigans, and uh, you've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been going before the Lord and asking, but it seems like they still are getting worse and worse. That can shake your faith. When your finances are uh, acting funny and uh, you have bills and responsibility, and it doesn't, when you add it all up, it doesn't seem to add up to be enough. That can shake your faith. And what happens is when various things, uh, let me just give a couple more. Uh, when the doctor gives a diagnosis that uh, is, is something that is life-threatening, where you're wondering, listen, I was dieting, I was eating right, I was trying to uh, exercise, and how did this happen? That can shake your faith. There's various things that uh, can shake our faith. When we're just minding our own business and somebody comes up and tries to knock us in the head and rob us, that can shake your faith. You wonder, God, where were the guardian angels? Where were my angels, God? That can shake your faith. So there's various things that uh, can shake our faith. And many of us, most of us, if you've been walking with the Lord for any length of time, you're going to have some things that come and shake your faith. A death of a loved one. And when you've been begging God to heal and God to deliver, but God seemingly doesn't answer like you want him to answer, that can shake your faith. When you've been doing the best you could in a leadership position and someone comes along and says, listen, your uh, services will no longer be needed. You're fired. This is your last day. I can shake your faith. I can shake your faith. Shake your faith. And so here uh, in this text, I want to show you something here. Uh, so Jesus gets this message that the one whom you love is sick. And so you know that this isn't just a, a regular type of Jesus, come on over here, and uh, we've given him some syrup, uh, cough syrup. and it, This is life-threatening for a number of reasons. One, uh, Jesus was almost run out of town. Well, not almost. He had to leave that area because the disciples, when the, he said, we're going back to Judah, saying, I know you're not going back there, Jesus, because uh, they were seeking to stone you. 
So you know that the sickness for Lazarus was serious. And for the sisters to send a note and ask him to come. And so for some of us that have our faith uh, shaken, um, we wonder, God, if you love me like you say you love me, if you, uh, uh, my Lord and Savior, like uh, you want to be, and I've been trying to do the best I can, why, uh, for someone whom you love, why do you uh, allow uh, these things to happen? Uh, here in uh, verse Six, it says, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Lord, not only why do you let things happen, why do you delay in coming? Why, why, God? You know, you, know, you, 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 you wait and, and hear Lazarus is sick. Uh, it says then, verse 7, after this, he says to the disciples, let's go to Judah again. And so he delays two days. We don't know how long it took for the messenger to come but, and to catch up with Jesus. One of the, uh, the brother and the disciples in verse 8 says, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered and said, there are, are, are not there 12 hours in a day. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees light of this world. Now, uh, Jesus, you're going back, but then you're talking in uh, riddles. What in the world are you saying, Jesus? And Jesus is reminding them that he told them, I believe it is in that eighth chapter, that he was the light of the world. And so listen, uh, though we're going back to Judah and though they were threatening us with stoning to death, but listen, as long as you're walking in the light, then you don't have to worry about it. It's when you're walking in darkness. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Verse 10, but if one walks in the light or in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after he said to them, our friend Lazarus, what? Sleeps. So Jesus, Lord, what are you saying? Okay, so you're saying uh, just be ready to walk with you. You are the light of the world. Uh, as long as we are walking with you, it doesn't matter what we are trying to anticipate. You have clarity of sight, and all we have to do is just stay close to you. But now you're saying that Lazarus, uh, they were saying he was sick. Uh, you're saying he sleeps, but you're just going to go and wake him. The disciple tells him, verse 12, as they're thinking from their own perspective, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. Uh, don't we have a way we, we want to tell Jesus how to work things out, huh? Like Jesus needs our advice. However, Jesus spoke to, uh, spoke of his death, but they thought he was thinking or speaking about taking rest and sleep. But watch this. In short order, uh, after they said that he was sick, after Jesus says he, Lazarus is asleep and I'm going to wake him, what does Jesus say? Verse 14. He says, now he speaks to them plainly, and he says, Lazarus is dead. Lord, I don't understand this. You, you delayed in going two days. You diagnosed him as being asleep. So that kind of took some of the urgency off of things because if he's asleep, then uh, the longer he sleeps, the better he might get. And so by the time we get there, he'll be feeling better. But then in just a, a few more uh, sentences, you tell us he's dead. It's something as we're uh, thinking about this walk with Jesus. Uh, it's easy for us if we try to use uh, our own sense of understanding. We try to understand a God from our perspective. It's easy to miss him. And I'm going to tell you why. The Bible tells us that God, when he speaks about himself, he says, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. And, and so, but, but, but I want you to understand something. Notice that 
what Jesus does is after he gets the report that uh, Lazarus is sick, he stays in verse 6. He stayed two more days in the place where he was. So there was no movement. There was no coming to my aid. If you will, Jesus set up a problem. He set it up so that there was a manifestation of death. Jesus set it up. And so I want you to, to know that uh, as we're looking at uh, just our lives, there's some things we set up because we mess up. And we mess up seemingly too much. Amen? Somebody tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. Yeah, but, but some things, yes, we've got to take responsibility. We messed up. Tell our neighbor, I messed up. And we need to sometimes, we really need to take ownership. Stop acting like you have arrived. You haven't arrived. Amen. We're on a journey. Matter of fact, if you act like or, or, or try to indicate that you've arrived, you're lying there. You're already telling me you got a problem. We're all on this journey. And we need the Lord every day. Step by step, we'll make this journey. Come on. So there's some things that we set up that we cause because of our disobedience or because of our just ignorance, uh, because of our not walking in faith. But there's certain things that the Lord allows to happen. He allows it to be set up. But I want you to understand there's a reason behind it. Tell your neighbor there's a reason. There's a, pur there's a purpose. Uh, here, uh, let me just... Uh, share a few things about Jesus as uh, we're looking and unpacking this in the next 10 minutes. Uh, one is that the Lord, and I believe I have uh, a PowerPoint on it, the Lord cares about us. He does. Uh, in verse 35 of that 11th chapter, the Bible gives us two words, one of the shortest verses in the Bible. It's Jesus wept. It's like right to the point, it's plain, it's clear. Jesus cares about us. Jesus loves us. Let's give the Lord a praise that he cares. But there's something else. In verse 39, it says, and Jesus uh, said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time uh, there is a stench for he has been dead four days. She's wanting to, in essence, really hone it in uh, that Jesus, if you were here, he would not have died. But because you took so long to get here, not only is he dead, but his body stinks. And so, uh, and why would you then even order for them to roll away the stone? But there's a point number two that Jesus is really always on time. Somebody ought to give the Lord a praise. It does not matter it does not matter what time he gets there. He's always, he's always on time. It doesn't matter uh, how bad the situation is when he shows up. Jesus is always on time. And there's something else. You see, uh, we cannot try to put Jesus to our timetable. Uh, in our timetable, our timetable is Jesus, we want you to move now. Uh, right now. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll even uh, look at the scripture and say, now faith is, you know. Uh, we, uh, but listen here, Jesus works on his own schedule. His ways are not our ways. And so, and, and he's never late. Hallelujah. He who created time but works in time and eternity knows what time it is. So Jesus deliberately set it up. There's a reason. But let me just say something else. Uh, one, Jesus cares about us. We need to remember. Two, Jesus is always on time. Three, the outcome might seem cloudy. It might seem cloudy. 
Uh, we, we don't understand all the Jesus. I, we don't understand that you're going back to Judea. It doesn't seem to make sense. Jesus, it doesn't make sense that you even need to go back anywhere. In the eighth chapter, uh, you were able to just uh, heal. You could preach. And also in the ninth chapter, you could just preach from where you were or teach. You told the centurion. You told the nobleman. You didn't even have to move. You, matter of fact, you marveled at one of the brothers because of his great faith. So, so why do we have to go back and for you to throw? yourself into jeopardy so the outcome might seem cloudy and that's because our level of understanding is distracting uh, you know there's just uh, no matter how smart we think and how much Bible we think we know we listen uh, God is just God and God says, listen, I want you to understand don't don't try to uh, uh, get deep with me that's why God has to speak in parables. He speaks in stories. And, and when he gives us stories, he talks about sheep and fish and lamb and trees and vegetation. He said, I, that's about as deep as I can get with you all. And then even then, when I give you uh, four different types of soil, but one seed, you all still have to say, now, what did you just say? So our level of understanding sometimes is distracting in our walk, but also uh, because of that, uh, because we're, we're not sometimes remembering how he cares, we're remembering that he's on time, uh, the outcome might seem cloudy, it might even seem not to our uh, advantage, uh, but I'm limited in what I know anyhow, so it might even cause us, isn't it something to have the audacity to debate the deliverer? We debate the deliverer. Mm. But, but you know what? Let me just say something, uh, and we're just really about finished. As I'm looking at the text, uh, if I look at early on in the scripture, in verse 4, uh, Jesus, when he heard that, he heard that uh, his friend, the one that he loved, is sick. This is what he says. He says, this sickness is not unto death. Now, Jesus uh, is on his way to the cross. And so uh, he's setting things up. Uh, this is one from John's perspective. This is one of the last miracles that Jesus is going to do. Mark has a different uh, picture and, and Matthew. But from John's perspective, the next big thing that we're going to see is the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But uh, before this, uh, Jesus is wanting them to uh, get a point here. He says, this is, sickness is not unto death, so that there is a sickness that's unto death. Uh, Jesus is speaking metaphorically, and he's really talking about even himself. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And so, listen, uh, yes, I know he's sick and uh, and he's really going to have to uh, die in one sense a physical death, but that's all right because I've come that he might have as well life and that more abundantly. But, but there's still some folk that have an issue with me being the son of God. And, and I'm still even in this, so I'm going to take my time. I'm going to take another two days to go there uh, because I need things to be just right. It's about the son of God and the son of God being glorified. Come on, give the Lord, I praise. And so it, it's not just that, but that's part A, but there's part B to this as we're looking at the text. Uh, here, uh, Jesus says in verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Uh, here, let me read on. Then the stone, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now Jesus is saying this. He didn't, he could have just quietly prayed, but he's praying so that those around can hear. And I know that you always hear me. Watch this. But because of the people who are standing, by I said this 
that they may what? Believe that you sent me. So it was about Jesus being glorified and their faith being delivered or being developed. Jesus being glorified and their faith in him being developed. Jesus was using the trouble. Sometimes our faith is shaken, but it's shaken for the glory of God. God is ultimately wanting to get the glory, but, he's, uh, but this is the thing. He wants to get the glory. He wants to be glorified. But the, but the Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews that without faith, it is what? In God loves us so much that he's saying, I will set things up. You might think that it's a delay, that it's a hindrance. God, where are you? God, you're quiet. God, you're delaying. God, I need you right now. God says, I know when to come. You just, but this is the thing. I want you to understand that I'm already there. When I came, I was Emmanuel, God with you. I never left you. I never departed. Matter of fact, I'm carrying you through whatever you've got to go through, but you don't have an operation of faith like I want, so I'm going to raise your level of faith, and I'm going to allow you to have to go through something. Somebody give the Lord a praise. I'm going to shake your faith. I'm going to shake it. I'm going to shake it. Let me give you three things and then we're out of here. One point A, the shaking of our faith is to awaken us to the state of our faith. Awaken us to the state. Do we believe what we say we believe? God says, listen, if, 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 if I'm a deliverer, uh, then, then uh, you need to know I'm a deliverer. And so I don't know, I, oh, well, God knows. You, you're not really displaying that I'm a deliverer. So I'm going to let you go through a little something. I'm going to delay. I'm going to uh, not show up right away. I need you to call on me as a deliverer. I need you to look for me to come and to deliver you. L listen, you say I'm a way maker. Well, you need to experience. I don't want you to just keep telling everybody somebody else's testimony. I want you to have a testimony yourself. You've experienced God as your own way maker. Somebody give the Lord over. Is he your bridge over trouble? Well, I'm going to wait until you need a bridge. Is he your healer? I'm going to wait until you need healing. Is he your lawyer in the courtroom? I'm going to wait until you get a case. Is he your doctor in the sick room? Somebody give the Lord a praise. Is he your provider? Well, I'm going to wait until your provisions are lean and you call it on a provider, God. Come on, come on, Lord. But then when you call on me, I don't want you to call in a sense of urgency and panic, but I want you to call on me, yes, with a sense of urgency, but praise. I want you to thank me already because, God, I know that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all I can ask or think according to the power that works within me. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a praise. So the shaking of our faith awakens us to our state of faith. The shaking of our faith, point number B, reveals the areas of faith that needs strengthening. Ah, so so sometimes we we uh, we're not speaking the words of faith out of our mouth. We're declaring some other crazy, strange stuff uh, that has nothing to do with the word. We're not allowing the word to shape what we say. Uh, we're letting the world shape. And God says, no, nah, uh, you need to strengthen that area with your, what's coming out of your tongue. Those aren't words of faith. You're speaking words of defeat. No, nah, I didn't tell you. You have. To be, I want you to know that there's nothing that is too hard for God. I want you to know that your situation that you're in, there's nothing too hard for God. God is a deliverer. He's a way maker. He'll work things out for your good. You just wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And I, listen, won't he strengthen your heart? Somebody give the Lord. Lord of praise. Some of us, when our areas of faith, we're allowing sight, sight to influence our walk too much. And, and we got to see something all the time. And, and God is saying, Lord, no, well, well, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. I'll hold this thing up. I'll just let it get a little worse than, than you had anticipated. Lord, what, this, this is really bad now, God. When, yeah, and it can get worse. But whenever I get there, I'm always on time. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise. 
So we're not speaking the words of faith. We're not walking by faith. We're doing too much sight walking and, and negative talking. So it reveals the areas of faith that need strengthening, those parts that need tuck pointing all on this building. And then uh, the shaking of our faith alerts us that we need to draw near to God by grabbing hold of our faith and until the, the shaking ceases. And so, hallelujah, I, I'm just, uh, I was looking at a movie on last night uh, as I was re resting, and it was really kind of this end of the world apocalypse sort of a thing, and the world was just coming apart, and uh, there was all these earthquakes, and one, uh, as the, the earth parted, and the guy, the, the husband, uh, was separated from his wife, but he told his wife, hold on, there was a pipe there, and he said, grab a hold of the pipe, and so as she grabbed a hold of the, the pipe, she was saved from falling in. You know, the old folk, you, when they would ask you, you'd ask them how they're doing, and they say, I'm holding on. I'm holding on, you know, and, and sometimes I don't like that, but, but that's all right. If that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. You got to hold on. Uh, the songwriter said, hold to his hands, God's unchanging hand. Jacob said, I'm not letting go until you bless me. And so as we're going through and our faith is being shaken our, our, and, and God is allowing things, we need to learn how to draw near to the Lord and hold on. Just visualize ourselves holding on to his hand and holding on to him. But know this, that in the book of Joshua, actually he says to, to, to Joshua that he would uh, not let him, uh, not drop him or, or leave him or forsake him. And the picture is, the actual Hebrew is that he will carry him. Him. And so what happens is we don't even have to worry about holding on, knowing that he's holding on to us. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise. So I celebrate. I thank God that God is at work. And though my faith might be shaken, but ultimately it's for his glory. Uh, God is molding me into the image of Christ. And so though my faith is shaken, uh, it's not only for his glory, but it's also uh, that I might learn to trust him and my faith in him increases. And as my faith in him increases, it pleases the father. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. So can you imagine when we develop in faith, it pleases him. And so what happens is what a great God that how he's at work and whatever I'm wrestling with, whatever I'm struggling with, he is it's not in vain. He's using that, though it might seem to shake my faith, but it's for his glory and for ultimately my good. Somebody give the Lord a praise. So in this text, God was just taking them all to a, another level. Verse 42, as we close out, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me before the glory of the Lord, that people might believe. I hear there's certain things that we're going to have to face. But as we're facing them, we're, and our faith seemingly might be uh, shaken, but that's all right. As we're just reevaluating and looking at God, you wanted me to draw nigh to you. God, you wanted me to trust you. God, you wanted to take uh, me to another level. God, you wanted me to check the cracks and the crevices, those things that make me vulnerable to unbelief. God, uh, even when it seems like you're delaying, but Lord, you're there. You're ever present. You're an ever present help. Hallelujah. In the time of trouble. God, I can trust you. And let God take you and I to another level. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Everyone standing. Come on, give the Lord a praise. I don't know, this has uh, been a, last week was a interesting week for me, but the Lord lets me know that it's not about me, it's about him. And it's about you. 
I'm a under shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And you're his flock. And so there might be some individuals that are going through some stuff. Faith shaken. The Lord just wanted a simple message to encourage you. Encourage your heart. Encourage your heart. You, you either, there's been a sense of loss or pain or great disappointment. Maybe your situation seems sick and you're needing divine intervention. That's the thing about Mary and Martha. They knew they needed divine intervention. And so if you're here today and you just want us to pray, you're, you're one of those that faith is shaken. And, and many times when, when faith is shaken, sometimes instead of us coming right to the altar, or right to uh, uh, the church, right to a body of believers, we pull away. We, we just want to be isolated. That's not of God. We need to stay together. Amen. And so I'm going to come down and we're going to pray. We're going to pray with you that God in the midst of shaken faith would let you know that he's never left you nor forsaken you. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. For additional information, please visit us on our website, our Facebook page, or Twitter. 